Hi, Mark. Um, hey, Brian, good to hear from you. Thanks for, for joining me on this uh, video podcast. Well, it's I, a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. I wanted to start um, it's by asking you about the case of um, Amord Arbery. It, re it recently came to light that he was actually chased for over four minutes before being shot and killed in, in broad daylight. Um, it, it sort of it's a, it reminds me, even if I wasn't, you know, if I didn't live in the U.S. at the time, of the worst time of uh, segregation in the U.S. when sort of lynching were common common practice. Um, what, what does it say about America when such things happen in 2020? It is uh, stunning um, that we are still having conversations about uh, lynchings in 2020. I mean, as you said, the, the incident with Ahmaud Arbery, the, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, is not just reminiscent of a lynching, it is a lynching. I mean, the core piece of the, the, the lynching, the lynching in the United States was the not just the killing of someone, but the extrajudicial killing of someone, deciding to be judge, jury, and executioner. You know, people sometimes think of lynchings as only happening with people dangling from trees. The hanging was one sort of lynching, but there were many other forms of lynching um, that that we know of uh, as well. Emmett Till uh, was lynched although he was beaten and dragged. Um, and so when you decide, even if we believe everything that his killer said, if even if, if you decide that because he's been robbing homes and because he's a burglar, that you are going to stop, apprehend, and ultimately execute him, then you are a lynch mob. Um, we have enough video footage to know that he didn't, uh, do anything wrong in this case. There's nothing illegal about jogging. There's nothing illegal about looking inside of a house. Many of their white neighbors, many of them were young people his age, did the same thing. And somehow they didn't find that suspicious. So there's the case itself, which is clearly a case to me of, of, of unmerited, vicious uh, violence. But then there's the bigger question, which is the question that you speak to, which is, you know, what does it mean for us to be having these conversations right now? What does it say about us that we're still having conversations about lynching uh, or about any sort of violence of this sort? And I think what it speaks to is the way that Black people in the United States are still not seen as full citizens. Uh, we're, we're not even seen in many ways as full human beings. And as a result of those dispositions, it becomes increasingly difficult, increasingly difficult. Um, to make an honest case that we are at a place of racial maturity or, or at a place of democracy or at a place of justice for all. Uh, America has always been a site of racial terror. America has always been a site of uh, exclusion, of, of colonial and settler colonial violence. Uh, and what we see here is just the latest iteration of it because um, when we look at Ahmaud Arbery, it's not different than the case of Trayvon Martin or other cases where citizens decide that they have a heightened sense or a heightened level of citizenship over their black counterparts so that George Zimmerman can ask Trayvon where he's going in his own neighborhood. Or this kid, Ahmaud Arbery, or he's 25, this, this young man uh, can be seen as suspicious simply for doing what other citizens do, explore the neighborhood, job, what have you. But because of their sort of heightened sense of citizenship, they feel like they have the right to decide where he goes, to limit where he goes, to patrol where he goes, to police him, and ultimately to impose their vision of justice on him. Uh, this is a structural problem. This isn't just about two or three rogue uh, uh, citizens. Uh, they do this with the support of a police department that doesn't investigate, that doesn't care. It's hard to imagine two or three Black people saying that they saw a suspicious white jogger and tried to you know, detain him and ultimately shot him after following him for 10 minutes and, and videotaping him. And there not even be an investigation, there not even be a, 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 an inspection, a, a drug test, a, a, you know, how carefully we're looking at the autopsy. Does this person even have to make a case for why they shouldn't be, um, be charged or, or arrested or investigated, why there's no grand jury? I mean, these are the things 
it, ultimately they had they were in possession of all the evidence and the police department made a different decision as we, i've been saying the police department did not investigate this because they saw the tape they investigated this because we saw the tape they always knew what happened and so you know you're looking at this at the, at the level of the, the the killers you're looking at this at the level of the police department and then we have to look at what it means for the entire public to watch this the re-traumatization of us vis-a-vis -vis the normalization of black violence on, on social media what does it mean for people to already be launching defenses of this i believe that they're going to find them guilty of murder i hope that they find them guilty of murder but there are many people saying oh no he should have submitted to them he shouldn't have resisted he should have done what he was told to do as if they're police officers again this idea that if i see three men on a pickup truck with guns i'm supposed to assume that they're performing a citizen's arrest as opposed to being the white citizens counsel there's no way to know this stuff so even in light of the evidence the overwhelming evidence of guilt the fact that there's a significant slice of Americans who don't want to believe what their own eyes told them speaks to the ways that we're not just only insufficient citizens, but we're also seen as insufficient humans, that we're not even getting the level of mercy and care and investment and uh, empathy. Not only the humans get, but sometimes the dogs get. I'd like to think that if, if those four men shot a dog on the side of the road, there'd be more empathy than some of these people are showing in the media and in, in, in social media and in everyday life. So, this really speaks to the permanence of white supremacy, uh, the inherent brokenness of our criminal justice system, uh, and the need to imagine a different way. Thanks. You, you mentioned that this was, um, this spoke about a broader sense of, of injustice in the US. I was um, preparing this interview, I was uh, reading the, the numbers related to COVID-19. So um, the African American population in the US accounts for about 13% of the overall population, but 60% of the dead so far have been Afro-Americans. Also recently in New York, um, I was reading that over 40 people, uh, like 40 people were arrested for social distancing violations. Out of these 40, 35 were black. So this, it's, it's uh, what does it say again about the US? It's, it's not an incident, right? I'm more than raising an incident. It's much more than that, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's structural. People, you know, the American liberal myth of colorblindness, um, it often is invoked, not just as a standard by which to uh, imagine our, our ideal society. We want to live in a world where we don't see race, we don't see color, um, but as an index of our progress, right? So we pat ourselves on the back and say, woo, race didn't matter here. Woo, we're all in this together. And in our haste to show how we're all in this together, we often ignore the ways that different people are differently impacted by something. Post 9-11, oh, we're all, 9 11 effect is a great tragedy. Of course it was. It all affects us equally. Of course it doesn't. Right? I mean, I, you, I couldn't look at Desi or South Asian or uh, Muslim or Arab or anyone who checks one or both of those boxes or all of those boxes, uh, you know, and tell them that somehow 9-11 affected everyone equally. Similarly, I can't look at 60% death rates for COVID-19 and say that COVID, it was the great unifier, right? I can't look at infection rates at 10 and 12% in New York prisons and, and jails and say that everybody is affected by coronavirus equally. It's just not true. Um, and the media initially, especially, wanted to frame this as a problem, uh, an epidemiological issue solely. And the only thing that would determine or, or lead to different outcomes, different health outcomes, would be our pre existing conditions. In some ways, that's true, but the pre existing condition that we need to be thinking about is white supremacy. The pre existing condition that we need to be thinking about is uh, wealth disparity, wealth inequality, structural inequality. That's the pre-existing condition. And so until we wrestle with that, until we get to the core of that, we're never going to arrive in the place that we need to arrive at. 
So when we look at these 60% death rate, it, it, it speaks to a few things. One, of course, it, it speaks to the, the, the lack of st structural access um, to, to better health outcomes. Um, the pre-existing health conditions that we do have um, often due to the fact that we don't have adequate health, the vulnerable doesn't have adequate health care access. And we live in a country that, doesn't, that does not have universal health care, but has universal health insurance. And our ability to get health insurance is tied to our ability to access certain types of employment. And so the most vulnerable, the most poor, the most marginalized doesn't get access to the type of health care that would make them less vulnerable. We live in places where there isn't housing justice, and so people are densely populated. They're packed in. And so it's hard to establish social distance when you live in a housing project. Um, many of us have, I, I, right now, we're doing a podcast from home. We're working from home. But it's not just frontline first responders that, that don't have that luxury, like law enforcement or nurses. It's also the person who works at that big box retailer that you go to so that you can load up on groceries once a week or, or twice a week with your fancy mask on and go back home. But what about the person who has to ring you up at the cash register? They're vulnerable every single day for a fraction of your income, oftentimes. So the vulnerable are going to be increasingly vulnerable. And then when we get into, get into those who have been caged, um, particularly at a place like Rikers Island in New York, where you know many people who are there for jail sentences are there, they haven't gone to trial yet. They're in jail simply because they don't have enough money not to be in jail. And so again, poverty becomes the pre-existing condition that makes them more vulnerable. And so the things that are making people susceptible to premature death have little to do with their individual choices and much more to do with a structure that keeps more burden on the vulnerable. And it's against the backdrop of that reality that we have to look at and understand COVID-19. You've actually touched upon all this in your, in your 2016 book, um, Nobody, uh, which showed that seven decades of Jim Crow followed by four decades of neo neoliberalism uh, were the breeding ground for what's, for what's happening today in, uh, in America. So in your opinion, could, an, could another world, because a lot of people talk about another world, you know, COVID could be the, the beginning of something new, but could we have another world while still living under a capitalist model? I think that there are always more humane uh, possibilities within the current system. We certainly could be more humane. We could always tinker. Uh, we could reform our way to more humane outcomes. The, the, the Trump administration um, is evidence that things could get worse. So even to dial back to the pre-Trump moment would be in some ways a sign of progress. But if we're talking about another world, if we're talking about a world where uh, the vulnerable are provided an adequate social safety net, if we're talking about a world where the prison isn't our primary mechanism of uh, resolving our social contradictions and, and the way we, we uh, attenuate harm, uh, if we're talking about a world where your access to capital doesn't determine whether or not you get a quality education or a quality doctor, then no, this system will never do that. We need to stop thinking that the system is broken and we need to make it work and rather recognize that the system is working exactly the way it's designed and that we need to break it. So yeah, my next question would be um, in a way about as activists, what we can start to do to break it um, in terms of um, activism, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which you are a part of, um, rose in a way out of all this in 2013 um, under Obama, it's important to say. But how important it's been, in your opinion, the Black Lives Matter movement? The Black Lives Matter movement is significant on multiple levels. And in, in, in the broader movement for Black Lives, um, which is that network of organizations across the United States and indeed the world at this point, um, it's important, one, to put a spotlight on Black humanity. Even the expression itself, Black Lives Matter, is not axiomatic. It's not self-evident uh, to the world. Rather, um, it is a world, we live in a world, rather, in which Black humanity is constantly called into question and challenge. So just the 
affirmation, the assertion that Black Lives Matter is, is a critical intervention. But at, the, but at the level of politics and political resistance, it's, it's a small slice of what's actually happening. What made Black Lives Matter significant wasn't a hashtag or a name, but rather a, a commitment to organizing against empire. And so for me, the Black Lives Matter movement was an opportunity to not just protest when the state kills us, but to make different demands and, and to, and to a, assert a, a radical, as Robin Kelly would say, freedom dream uh, about what the world could be uh, under new possibilities. We don't just want kinder and gentler cops. We, just, we don't want to replace white cops who beat us with black cops who beat us. We don't want uh, to make warmer and fuzzier prisons. We want to imagine a world without policing and without um, the prison as our primary mechanism for, again, resolving our social contradictions. So Black Lives Matter does that. Black Lives Matter understands this in transnational context. Um, so that we're not just thinking about what's happening here, but we're linking it to what's happening in Palestine. We're linking it to what's happening on the continents of Africa. We're linking it to what's happening in Latin America. And we understand the relationship between this. It's an anti-imperialist uh, political project uh, that is rooted in um, some really important anti-imperialist and anti-colonial uh, movements that, that we've seen in the States and, and, and around the globe in substantive fashion throughout the 20th century, and certainly by the 1950s after uh, the Bandung Conference of 55. So we're, they're part of a deep, long tradition of internationalism and freedom fighting that I think gave us something uh, to model ourselves after, but they weren't abstract, and they weren't just abroad. They also made policy demands. You know, contrary to what people said that they were just there yelling and shouting and protesting, BLM was making policy demands. And and honestly, we're at a moment right now in the 21st century where you can't run for mayor of a major city and not talk about your strategy for policing. You can't at least have a conversation about body cameras or, or civilian review boards. You, you can't have these conversations um, without significant um, analysis, self-critique, or at least uh, transparency, at the very least, uh, about what you're going to do. That's a response to BLM. That's a response. Um, so it's been incredibly effective in, in producing outcomes, but it's also been incredibly effective in expanding our, uh, our radical imaginations and, for, and, and, and sort of creating fertile ground uh, for more people to dream ambitious freedom dreams beyond just the liberal reforms that many of us have been calling for. Okay, I'll end with a, a question about the forthcoming election. Um, Joe, Joe Biden won the nomination pretty much thanks to um, Afro-American voters, right? Um, how important is the next election? Um, is it very important or it's, it's important to get rid of Trump, but to continue sort of radical activism? Um, because Joe Biden obviously is not the biggest socialist we know of. Um, I think that every election is important. Um, but I, I think there is something about this election that has a certain type of urgency to it. Um, it's an urgent moment and we need to respond to it. But as you alluded to, it's not either or, it's both and. The goal should be to get rid of Trump. But the goal should also be to build something significant. The goal should be to build a radical movement that doesn't start and end with who's president, right? The, 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 the rad a radical project, which is about, again, getting to the root causes of, of our social uh, crisis um, and our social contradictions, will never be resolved uh, at the level of the head of empire. So no matter who the president is, we have work to do as organizers, as strategists, as tacticians, as teachers, um, but I'd much rather do it with Trump not in the White House. So imagining a strat, but imagining a strategy that does that is different than conceding the liberal democratic point, which is we got to get back to normal again. Right? Normal would be the pre-Trump moment. Normal would be the pre-COVID moment. Um, normal has done extraordinary harm to poor people. Normal has done extraordinary harm to trans folk. Normal has done extraordinary harm. Uh, to third world, global south folk. Um, normal 
is anything but humane. And we have to imagine something outside of that as well. Thanks, Mark. Thank Cheers, man.